Hello. In this second part of the video series on multi-way analysis, we are going to talk more about the Parafact model, which is one of the most important uh, freeway models or multi-way models in general. In order to explain Parafact, we're going to uh, start by looking a little bit at PCA. PCA is a bilinear model. We call it bilinear <coughs> because it's linear in the scores and linear in the loadings. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, here we can see the PCA model, a two-component PCA model of a matrix. We call the scores A here, and we call the loadings B. This is the first component, and this is the second component. We can add more components as we like, uh, and in the end, what we haven't, haven't described, we put in the residuals E. Now, often we write this with matrices, uh, but we can also write it in scalar notation. The scalar notation is not very intuitive, but the thing is that linear algebra is only uh, applicable on two-way matrices. It's made for uh, two-way matrices. So we cannot easily write something like a freeway model with matrices. And that's why we stick to the uh, scalar notation here. If we take a little look at this, we can see that we have one element of our matrix here. It's the i-th row and the j-th column. And the PCA model of that is something with scores times loadings. The i-th scores of component 1, 2, 3, 4, up to capital F. And the j-th loadings from 1 to uh, the number of components. So if you sit and look at this for a little while, you can sort of convince yourself that the, this is indeed uh, PCA. And when we have this equation, it's very easy to see how we can add another dimension. So add a third dimension in our data set. And we can do that by simply adding another set of components. So we add a component matrix, like we call it C here, for the third mode. And you can see that that's a very simple extension of PCA. And it really is an extension of PCA. So instead of scores and loadings, every component now has scores and loadings for this mode and loadings for this mode. That's the Parafact model. So it's very similar to PCA. It's an old model. It was invented in 1970 by Richard Harshman, actually based on some really uh, old ideas from the 40s uh, about factor rotations. And there was actually a, a similar model developed in, in the 20s uh, by a man called Hitchcock, um, but that was sort of forgotten in the meantime. But Richard Harshman was the one who made the Parafact model uh, popular in the end. Rank is a term that we know and it can be defined in, in uh, different ways. But one way to define rank of a matrix is that the rank is the minimum number of PCA components that we need to reproduce the matrix exactly. So if I can describe a matrix by three PCA components, then the rank of that matrix is free. Now it's exactly the same if we talk about freeway data. The rank of a freeway array is the number of Parafact components that we need to reproduce the array. So for example, if I can describe an array with four components, Parafact components, the rank of that freeway array is going to be four. There's a difference uh, from two-way to freeway or multi-way in general, in that row rank is not the same as column rank, which is not, again, the same as rank. It's a very fundamental property in linear algebra that row rank equals column rank equals rank, but that's not the case here. Um, and we will get back to that when we talk about the Tucker model, which is associated with row and column rank, uh, whereas Parafact is just related to rank. When we talk about rank for matrices, uh, most people who work with uh, linear algebra have an intuitive understanding of rank. So for example, if I take a random 2x2 two two matrix, and that could be random drawn from any kind of distribution, if I take a random 2x2 two two matrix, the rank will always be 2, or it will be 2 with probability 1. Now, if I take a freeway array, 
a 2x2x2 two by two by two freeway array. The funny thing is that the rank is not going to be 2, or actually sometimes it will be, sometimes it will be 2, and sometimes it will be 3. That means the rank is not really defined in the same way for freeway arrays as, as it is for two-way arrays. And that shows you that not all the properties that we are used to extend to, uh, multi, to the multi-way situation. And there's a lot of unsolved problems, properties, etc., in uh, freeway analysis that need to be looked into. And understanding rank is one of them, because rank really behaves differently uh, for multi-way data uh, compared to two-way data. If we look at a 9x9x9 nine by nine by nine array with random numbers, what would the rank be? Well, actually, nobody knows about that. Um, there's a lot of uh, different dimensionalities that we do know the possible ranks of, but there's even more where we have absolutely no idea uh, what the rank uh, is. And a 9x9x9 nine by nine by nine is one example of this. A 9x9 nine nine matrix, of course, is ranked 9 if we uh, plug random numbers into it. Okay, so Parafax seems to be a straightforward extension of PCA. Why would it then be interesting to use? Well, in order to uh, show some interesting properties of Parafax, we're going to look at an example, and this example is using fluorescence spectroscopy. If you're not familiar with fluorescence spectroscopy, it's probably a good idea uh, to look into some literature on that uh, beforehand. We are not going to explain that in detail uh, here. But we are going to look at a uh, example of the use of fluorescent spectroscopy. It is very often used in environmental monitoring. Uh, for example, here where we take some water samples from different areas. And by looking at the fluorescence of these water samples, we can make some qualified guesses on the organic matter um, and, and get ideas on pollution sources and, and things like that. So the idea is that we take water samples and we measure fluorescence excitation emission matrices. And these fluorescence uh, excitation emission matrices uh, will be a landscape for every sample. We send in light at different excitation wavelengths and we measure at different excitation wavelengths. So we get landscapes like the green landscape shown here. And approximately every peak here like these, is a chemical. These parts here are scattering signals that we are not really interested in, uh, but that's beyond the scope of uh, this little course here. But these we would try to eliminate somehow if we were to analyze these samples um, uh, seriously. Fluorescent spectroscopy is very useful because it, it monitors a lot of um, important uh, chemicals in, in, uh, in biology, uh, proteins uh, and chlorophylls and, and other things. Uh, so that's one reason uh, why it's used in environmental monitoring. Another uh, reason is the high sensitivity it has. But until recently, state-of-the-art analysis of data like this would be to just look at the landscapes. Here's a typical landscape of a water sample. And by looking at this, we can actually see that, for example, we have signals here in the protein area. Uh, and we don't seem to have a lot of information in the upper area here, uh, maybe in the area of NADH and, and things like that. But it's very crude when we only look at this uh, visually. Sometimes people would integrate areas, but we can easily overlook small peaks, uh, and that would be a problem. And it seems like it's not a very efficient use of all the information we get uh, from uh, data like these. So let's see uh, what we can do with Parafact. If we take a look at one particular sample, we can look at a sample in different ways. One sample would give us a matrix, an excitation emission matrix. And you can see that we can we can sort of represent it in different ways, but it really is a matrix. So we can do PCA uh, on the set of spectra that we have in a fluorescence excitation uh, matrix. And if we do that, we would get scores and loadings like these. And we can see that they do reflect the chemistry. We get loadings that have peaks in areas where there are peaks in the spectra, etc. 
But actually, when we look at the spectra here, I can almost see exactly what the peaks should be. I can see that this is really a sum of three underlying peaks, and that's definitely, definitely not what we get in the PCA model. Because PCA has this rotational uh, non-uniqueness. I get some scores and loadings in PCA, but really I can just rotate my loadings if I counter-rotate my scores. The actual orientation of my scores and loadings are not defined. And that's why I never get pure spectra or anything like that in PCA, or at least that's one of the reasons why we're never going to get pure spectra or pure uh, um, concentrations um, uh, from a PCA model. Instead, we get these orthogonal abstract components that do reflect the chemistry, but we don't really get the chemistry directly. And what we're going to see is that Parafact can actually give us this. So let's take a look at how we can model uh, fluorescence data. Here's one sample. We can see that there's a peak coming from one underlying analyte, a fluorophore. We can see there's also actually a shoulder representing another analyte. And in fact, there is a third one, but we cannot see the third one because it's so small in signal compared to the other two. Now, if I knew what this sample consisted of, this co sample of mixture, well, then I could model it through Beer's law as a contribution from the individual analytes. So every analyte will have a distinct emission spectrum, and every analyte will have a distinct excitation spectrum. And if, for example, I'm only modeling the leftmost sample, well, then I would get the outer product of the emission and the excitation spectrum. So I would get a landscape like the purple one, for example. If I change the concentration of the purple analyte, it's not going to change uh, its shape. The only thing that changes is the magnitude. That's Beer's law, l the linearity. So if I know the concentration of each of the free chemicals, I can just scale the landscapes, and I can just add them together, and that would actually be what I would measure. So this is really just Beer's law, saying that I can describe my mixture as the underlying pure excitation and pure emission spectra and the concentrations. So let's take a look and see how that would work if we took several samples. Here we have one sample. Now I can describe this sample as a linear combination of three uh, underlying uh, signals. In this particular sample we only have the blue analyte. So I just multiply the red and the green landscape by zero and then I can model the blue sample. Here's another sample and this sample only contains the red analyte. But I can still model it by exactly the same three chemicals, but now I just multiply the blue and the green one by zero. No matter what combination of these three uh, analytes I have, I can model them with the same spectra by just modifying the concentrations. And this is all just Beer's law. But what is really beautiful here is that this is in fact also Parafact. If you look at the five samples to the left, these are five mixtures. If I take these five mixtures and I build a free component Parafact model, I'm going to get the underlying excitation and emission loadings, and I'm going to get the underlying chemical concentrations, as shown to the right. Parafact has a very special property, and that is that there's no rotational freedom like there is in PCA. In PCA, we get the pure spectra, but they are sort of orthogonalized, so it's a linear combination of the underlying spectra. In Parafact, we actually don't have any rotational freedom, so we don't just get some arbitrary 
uh, rotated version of our spectra, we get the real spectra. So instead of just looking at these uh, landscapes, we can build a Parafact model and get the actual landscapes. And we can identify them chemically, say exactly what they are, and we can also add concentrate uh, estimate the concentrations and say how much of each of these, these landscapes uh, we have in a given sample. And we're going to look at how we do this uh, in MATLAB in the next video.